Our next guest has distinguished himself as a keen observer of human behavior. He has parlayed that into a career in which real estate developers have thrown a lot of money at him. And my sources tell me that they consider it money well spent. Recently, he has turned his analysis to our changing demographics, our technology, a broader understanding of culture and consumption. And he's become a kind of forecaster of just what kind of world you will soon be living in. Please welcome David Allison. Hello, Vancouver. I've always wanted to do that. Here's my chance. I have to tell you, I'm a little bit nervous about tonight because I, I'm very used to public speaking. I do a lot of talking, but I don't usually only have seven minutes. My joke with my friends has been it takes me longer than seven minutes to brief the pizza delivery guy on how to get to my house. So this is going to be really interesting to see whether I can get through this or not. Uh, I was actually struggling with this a little bit. And are you able to see something up there that I'm not able to see here? Interesting. There we go. Um, I was struggling with this a little bit. I've been rehearsing this over and over again. You see, what I do for a career is I help really complex organizations and really complex projects figure out what the patterns are that they're experiencing and all the different aspects of their thing. Uh, and then I try and help them figure out how to tell a story or figure out what the signal is that comes from those patterns. So I knew what my pattern was, but until I had breakfast this morning, you know how the universe gives you what you need sometimes? I had breakfast this morning with this incredibly intelligent woman named Maura Coyle, and Maura works at UBC, and she is a designer of policies. Now, I'd never heard of this before. She is a designer, has a design background, and what she designs is policies on how we live and how we work with institutions and how we relate to the government and how we relate to universities and banks and all of these other sorts of things. And the light bulb went on for me. So I have two slides I want you to pay particular attention to as I go through my slides today. The first one is a picture of a locomotive, and the second one is a picture of a potter at a potter's wheel. So we'll talk about those ones a little longer than we will some of the others. So my industry, the advertising, marketing, and branding industry, has been rocked by technological disruption. Uh, I will give you a quick example. When I first started in the industry, we would charge a client $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 to make a logo. That was one of our major revenue streams. There were all kinds of other revenue streams. I'm just picking on one to give you an example, because I only have seven minutes. So these three logos, I got online, and I went onto a crowdsourced website. I got a designer in some other part of the world that I'm never going to meet and never have a conversation with. In 12 hours and for $10, he provided these three semi kind of horrible logos. But they're still, the point <laughs> is, I got three logos done in 12 hours for 10 bucks, and we used to charge $30,000 for that. So imagine you take that all the other revenue streams that come into an ad agency and understand why that industry is having so much difficulty right now making a buck. And it's not just the advertising industry. Who's used a travel agent in the last little while? Hardly anyone. I remember a time when you couldn't fly from here to Kelowna without calling a travel agent. But guess what? Technology screwed that up. The internet came along, and now we can all book our own flights, and we can all do anything we want, uh, pretty much. I mean, there's still some specialists and outliers. If you're trying to climb Kilimanjaro, you might want to call the right travel agent about that. But generally speaking, we don't need travel agents the way we used to. Photography is another great example. I'll go back to the advertising industry. We we used to have to spend ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars with a photographer before we were able to make a brochure or a print ad or anything for one of our clients. Well, guess what? Photography today is largely free. It's online. The expensive stuff is ten dollars, maybe a hundred if you're like getting Andy Lebowitz to do something for you, right? But largely as a, as a career choice, photography is no longer available to the numbers of people it used to be available to. So my point here is that technology is going to change everything for everyone, everywhere. And it's our job to watch for the patterns. Let's look at some historical patterns to begin with. The Industrial Revolution. Here's that first slide I wanted you to pay attention to, the locomotive. So what happened during the Industrial Revolution? Bunch of new tools, right? We had factories. We had assembly lines. We had transportation infrastructure. We had cars. We had electricity. We had light bulbs. We had all these things that were invented, but more importantly, I think we as human beings were changed because we invented the weekend. We invented paid vacations. We invented healthcare. Uh, we invented all kinds of other things that made our lives different. The one I found out about getting ready for tonight that fascinated me the most is that we invented the nuclear family. 
Prior to the Industrial Revolution, we lived in large family groups with multiple generations, and our aunts, and our uncles, and our nieces, and our cousins, and our nephews. Sounds like a nightmare to me, but this is how we lived. This was what the family was. And the industrial complex found this very inconvenient, because it was hard to move units of labor from one part of the railroad to another part of the railroad, or from one factory to another factory. So they concocted this notion that, no, 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 the family is actually mom, dad, and the kids. Those are easier units of labor to move around, and we all still believe that. We have a term for it. We call it the nuclear family. So these moments, these revolutionary moments when they come along, they don't just change tools. This isn't just about technology taking over technology. This is about how we live, how we work, how we play, and who we are, how we walk through our day, how we live on this planet, what makes us happy, what makes us sad. Let's look at the next one. I'm calling this Industrial Revolution 2.0. There's a lot of technologies that are coming our way, a lot of disruptive patterns to pay attention to. But I only have time to talk about one, so I've picked on 3D printing. These are busts of me and my husband, made by a friend of ours in about 35 minutes in his dining room. He had his iPod, his iPad, he walked around us and did a little scan. We went into the kitchen, had a glass of cab sav. By the time we came back 35 minutes later, these things had popped out of this printer about the size of a coffee machine that cost $500. So this is 3D printing, as we most of, most of us understand that this stuff is capable. We're all capable of these things today, and these printers are becoming, they're like toys for kids. They make themselves bracelets and whatever. But did you know we're 3D printing skyscrapers in Singapore? Office and residential towers? We're 3D printing cars that go faster than a McLaren supercar. These cars are being printed on a 3D printer. We're printing human organs that are being transplanted into human beings successfully. I love this story. We're printing genetically identical rhino horns. And what we're going to be able to do with these is flood the market and stop the poaching happening. So we may even save a species from extinction. We're 3D printing food. There's a pop-up restaurant company operating in London right now where the whole restaurant is 3D printed. The cutlery, the tablecloth, the table, the chairs, the food, everything is 3D printed. We're printing clothes and shoes and teacups and all kinds of stuff is being 3D printed all over the world. So this is a technology that's already disrupting the manufacturing sector. Here's that slide I want you to think about a little bit more. Now imagine with me for a moment if 10... 20, 30% of the stuff that you have to go and buy right now from someone else, you suddenly don't have to go and buy from someone else. Very soon, we're going to have 3D printers in our homes that are very sophisticated. So let's say 30% for the sake of argument. 30% of the retail establishment is gone because you're making your own stuff. 30% of everything that you need to go and earn money for is gone because you're making your own stuff. You don't have to go to work as much. You have more time with your friends and family. You get to spend more time uh, doing the things that you love to do. It changes the way we live, work, and play. It changes who we are. Three things to remember. I forgot. I was going to show you this one list little guy. They're making me, they're, they're saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. So I'm not seeing the same slides as you anymore. So uh, this is a 3D printed living organism. This thing knows how to feed itself, it knows how to expel waste, it moves around inside its own little cubicle, it responds to outside stimuli. Now imagine if we take that and marry it with AI, with artificial intelligence, pretty soon we're going to be 3D printing sentient beings and then what is the future of the human race? So, I think we need some policies. There's three big rules I want you to remember and then I promise you, Mr. Flashy Screen, I will wrap up. So the first rule I want you to remember as we go forward into this brave new world is to be fascinated by this stuff. Don't let it blow over your head. Don't say, I'm not that techie guy. I'm not interested in these things. You have to be interested in these things. These are gonna change our world. The second one is when you figure out what's going on, be good. Do good. Get to the right place in the right way. And lastly, let's use this opportunity, this change in the world, to help each other, to do things so that we all end up in a better, happier place. Thank you very much. <laughs>